It's such an honor and privilege to be here with you today, Jane, and with everybody else on this um, amazing panel. And Jane, I just have so much love and respect for you, so it's so nice to see you again today. As I, as I said in my language, um, my name is Melina Miwap in Lubokan Massimo, and I come from the Lubokan Cree Nation, which is north of the medicine line. Today I am calling in from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. I was born in Northern Alberta, as Jane mentioned, in a small indigenous community called Little Buffalo, in the homeland of the community, uh, the homeland of the Lubokan Cree, which is my nation. We are located in the tar sands, which is one of the largest industrial extraction zones on the planet and in the genesis of the KXL pipeline, the TMX pipeline, line three, and many others that extend like tentacles from our homelands. There's other pipelines I won't name here today except for one, but we have stopped them dead in their tracks um, over the years of campaigning, namely the Enbridge Northern Gateway pipeline and others that I won't name today because there's so much to celebrate. Um, but I, as I mentioned, I was born into a community from that was already actually fighting to protect Mother Earth and dispossession when I was born. My first blockade was at the age of seven when my community was blocking a newly built road into our territory that brought with it deforestation and oil and gas extraction. I've seen and experienced massive oil spills across Northern Alberta, in, namely in 2011, right next to our community's homes was one of the largest spills in Canada's history. My family couldn't breathe, their eyes were burning, their stomachs were turning, the school needed to be shut down for, for weeks. This was one of the reasons why I chose to testify before the US Congress in 2012 to let them know about the detrimental impacts of the tar sands and why the KXL pipeline needed to be stopped. In Northern Alberta, we see tar sands mines the size of entire cities, and we see the ancient, pristine, beautiful boreal forest, the northern lungs of Mother Earth being decimated, fragmented, and scraped away for oil, gas, fracking, and tar sands. Never in my lifetime did I think I would witness such devastation to our land, our waters, our medicines, and our peoples. We are not only in an ecological crisis, but we are in a moral human crisis. All around the world, we see people's homes and traditional territories being turned into industrial landscapes. We see people fleeing their homes and becoming refugees because it is no longer safe to stay in their homelands. We see land defenders being murdered for standing up to protect our collective future. And we continue to see women being raped, violated, and abused. These colonial values of domination are embedded in values of patriarchy. And this is why we continue to see the raping and pillaging of Mother Earth, as well as violence against women. The earth is our mother and violence against the earth begets violence against women. And as a sister and a family member of a murdered or missing indigenous woman, I can tell you that as indigenous people, not only are we standing up to protect the land, but we are fighting to protect the women all at the same time. So myself and other indigenous leaders spent years building a movement against the tar sands. Our elders signaled the alarm for us and we followed in their footsteps. We traveled from community to community, country to country, and protested at the AGMs, AGMs of company after company and met with countless investment firms and parliamentary officials across Canada, Europe, and the US to say the time is now to divest from fueling the climate change crisis and violating indigenous rights and destroying our homelands. In, 20, in 2007, I remember it was such a joke to them of what we were asking, but that didn't deter us. We kept demanding, we kept speaking out, and after nearly 12 years of nonstop campaigning, we are seeing a multitude of oil and gas companies and investment firms pulling out of the tar sands, signaling to the world that, is no, that it is no longer business as usual in the tar sands. And I think this is an important victory to celebrate as a climate victory, though the fight is not over yet. The question that kept coming up to me over and over after the oil spill was, how do I build the future I want to see? And after years of campaigning, I knew I needed to start building climate solutions. I knew I needed to start building a yes to our no's. So in 2013, I started to fundraise and research how to bring about solar into my home community, where no one had actually ever seen solar panels. And by 2015, I built beside, alongside with my community a 20.8 kilowatt system that powers our health center. It was one of the first indigenous led and community owned solar projects in the heart of the tar sands. And then I created an organization called Sacred Earth Solar, which continues to help fundraise and build solar projects for indigenous communities across Turtle Island. 
Through the work of Sacred Earth Solar, I've helped to solarize the tiny house warriors who are indigenous women, sequetmic women, who are building tiny houses in the path of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And also Sacred Earth Solar is now working with indigenous climate action to solarize cabins in Wet'suwet'en territory that are building cabins to protect, to protect their territory from fracked gas pipelines. This year, I also hosted and launched a TV series called Power to the People, which is currently airing on national TV here in so-called Canada. This show, which is the first of its kind, features Indigenous communities that have transitioned to renewable energy, have implemented food security projects, and have implemented eco-housing. We filmed in 26 locations coast to coast, but just so everybody knows, there are actually already over 2,300, 2,300 small to medium scale and renewable energy projects in indigenous communities across the country and over 180 large scale revenue generating projects in indigenous communities that are literally getting communities 100% off diesel. These stories paint a picture of the future I want to see, the future that is here, the future that is now. So these are the pathways that exist, they already exist towards recovery, resilience, and preparedness. Many of them can be seen in the stories of Power to the People. They are also inspiring climate victories. And we need to celebrate these communities and their examples of leadership as they forge paths towards a just recovery. It is critical to support indigenous people, in, sorry, it is critical to support indigenous media so our peoples can speak for ourselves and tell our own stories, stories that have been silenced for far too long, stories that need to be here, heard, and stories that will heal the world. Colonial governments must stop bailing out the fossil fuel industry and instead implement innovative policies and legislation that hold climate criminals, criminals accountable and usher in a just transition. It is up to us to hold these governments and corporations accountable for our current planetary collapse. In order to continue to do this work though, we must implement regenerative practices, healing justice and decolonization in our movements. Every person is needed to fight climate change, to fight environmental and systemic racism and demand climate justice. Governments and corporations try to make us feel small, but we are not small, we are many and we are powerful. We have heard here today that it is the power of people, people power that brings about climate victories. Together, we must make the choice to continue to act to save our planet from climate chaos. But we must be united, we must be vigilant, and we must act in protection of all future generations. Hi, hi, thank you so much.